as heck for the guests we have today. Chris Suarez, the last time you were in our region was, uh, the last time I saw you in our region was one of Al Donahue's events, and, and I was blown away. I think you're one of the funnest presenters out there, one of the most informative guys. And now, for those of you that don't know Chris, he was a team leader. Now, I believe, Chris, and feel free to correct me, you had an agent challenge you that you don't know perhaps how to sell real estate as much as they did. So you decided to go out there and build a huge real estate selling empire now in multiple states. Is that a decent summation? Yeah, it's pretty close. <laughs> not, not bad, right? So for, for the folks on the call that may not know you, and again, we'll probably see people still loading on because we did change the time. Give us kind of a little background on you and you know, where you came from and what your business looks like today. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was actually um, born and raised in New York. Uh, born in Brooklyn and uh, grew up in um, White Plains and then uh, in Putnam County and then back down to the to the city. I went to NYU. Nice. Um, started my real estate career out in New York and um, about actually it was right after 9/11. Um, I moved out to the West Coast. So I've been um, I've been uh, in real estate for 20 gosh two ish years, um, which is uh, awesome and depressing all at the same time. <laughs> uh, just because. <laughs> Because I forget um, how quick time goes and how old I am, but um, but uh, so, so how does the West Coast compare to Westchester, Putnam, and uh, the the boroughs? Uh, you know, I I've always said that um, learning the business on the East Coast gave me a huge competitive advantage for the West Coast. Truly, um, just you know the the level of professionalism that needs to show up on the East Coast, um, the pace of life on the East Coast. Uh, I love it out here on the West Coast, um, and yet uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm still a New Yorker, and, and that has served me incredibly well out here. Yeah, I always say there's a certain pace. I lived in New England for a couple of years. When you get used to the pace of the greater New York area, you move in even faster when, when you live outside of New York, right? That's probably what yeah. you mean by that, that, that you know, up on the West Coast. Yeah. So, so you've, got, you've got a team in how many states? So uh, my home team is in Portland. Uh, in, in PDX. And um, I launched um, right around that time where I said, well, I'm going to get back into production. I was a team leader. I became the OP of that office and then launched my team here in Portland about 10-ish um, years ago. Uh, got back into production for the first time on the West Coast. Um, that team uh, became an MREA team. So we net a million dollars uh, three years into building that team. And it's net a million dollars I'm um, truly right after expenses, after paying me, after paying everybody, um, that business itself nets a million dollars every year for the last seven years. Nice. Now, four-ish years ago, um, we decided to um, launch our first expansion uh, team. And so now, um, experience last year, uh, we were 12 um, locations last year, 12 teams. Um, every one of those teams did between a million to three million in GCI. Wow. Um, in those 12 locations. And um, last year, we, we did about a half a billion in, in real estate volume. We did 13 million in revenue um, and sold, gosh, you know, collectively, I think um, about 2,000 houses. Wow. Uh, awesome. And then beginning of this year, um, Ben, Kenny, and I have been friends and, and just sort of collaborators for the last four or five years. Uh, but Ben and I um, launched a, a new expansion uh, platform and real estate uh, platform called Place. Um, so Experience and Ben Kinney companies came together. Um, and uh, right now we are about uh, 46, 47 um, teams uh, across the country. Um, collectively, we did about 1.5 billion in, in real estate sold over the last 12 months, rolling 12 months and about 40, 40 plus million in revenue. So awesome. uh, we're, we're, you know, in terms of number of states, I think we're in about 20, 23, 24 states right now. And now, now that place is kind of a platform you're using to attract non-KW people into it in order to give them some support, or is it still KW based? It's that picture. That it, on the real estate side of things, um, we, we, are, we are partnered with uh, KW agents. Gotcha. Um, we've had uh, a few actually, um, even on the East Coast um, recently. Uh, come into our network that were not KW, one, a Sotheby's agent that is now KW, um, and then um, an independent that uh, transferred over to KW. So it's been a, a great attraction to the brand. So the place is kind of a cool feeder for you guys to attract people from outside and, and then probably transition them into local market centers for a win, win, win. Yeah, that's what we've been doing. 
Awesome. So, so you've got obviously a breadth of knowledge with real estate, but in a long time, you, you were 22 years, you're probably right there in 9-11, again in 2008. And now, how do you describe what's going on in today's market? You know, perhaps compared to some of the other ships you've seen. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, for, from my perspective, um, no one's really going to like it when I say this, but today is no different than it was in in 01. It's no different than it was in, in 08. It's no different than it was last month from my perspective. Okay. Um, and I think from for, for me, uh, it, it change only causes me to ask myself, hey, how was I doing business? How do I need to do business? And how will I do business? Like it, it, change for me is, is, is an accelerator as much as a, um, as much as a shift. So, uh, you know, I look at the way that we're doing business right now and we were going to do business this way at some point in the future. It might've been three months from today. It might've been a year from today. It could have been seven years from today. So for me, uh, 20 years later, I'm actually grateful for these moments in time that, that actually accelerate our industry because as yep. an industry, we need to get, we need to rethink what and how we do it. And I actually, I believe that on the other side of this, um, it doesn't feel like it right now, but we're going to be grateful uh, for, 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 for the time period that has caused us to get more efficient and more effective in, in what we do every single day. Um, and it will, it will make our industry better. Yeah, I love your perspective on that. The change was coming. This accelerates it. So instead of it taking three years, we had accelerated it in about three weeks. And I, and I think that's where it's exciting for guys like you and me, many of the people on the call, because we're choosing to embrace the change and go with it. We're going to be able to kind of speed up ahead of our competition and ahead of those that are kind of avoiding it or ignoring it. Yeah, you know, I was listening to an interview um, maybe just a couple weeks ago. Uh, actually, one of one of my favorite guys to listen to. His name is James Altucher, a New Yorker, lives in New York, um, was in the financial market, still is, and, and actually is an incredible entrepreneur. Um, and he said something that I wrote down and I've been sharing with as many people as I can. He said, never waste a good crisis. Mm. Never waste a good crisis. A lot of agents right now are wasting it. They're they're sort of hunkered down. Um, they've decided, well, we can't do what we what what it is we're supposed to do. So I'm just going to wait this out. And and actually, that's been the premise of of probably my 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 message out to to groups as I'm speaking with them, or regions as I'm speaking with them, offices as I'm speaking with them, that this time is actually um, just showing us whether or not. Um, we, we ultimately had built the skills necessary to last in any business, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's real estate, whether it's insurance, whether we had a job, um, we just, we, crisis is, is, is never waste a good crisis. Like I can't say it any better than that. Yeah. No, that that's a great point. It's a great opportunity because two types of people show up in crisis. The people that see that there's opportunity to change, reinvent and grow and those that you know, might act from fear and avoid doing anything. So again, it's a great opportunity to, to get your, your competitive advantage. Now you said we were due to change. Give me two or three examples of the things you've seen that have been created in the last few weeks that are going to be here for a while or, or be part of our new norm moving forward. Yeah, I think um, the way that our, the, where our industry was going, um, the, the, the biggest complaints I heard leading up to this um, crisis was that um, people were taking our business, right? Our buyers were ending up in, with tech companies and, and Redfin was coming into markets and there was immediate showings and push a button and an agent will pop up and show them a, a condo or a home or an apartment. And, and we as real estate agents, one, couldn't compete with that. Two, didn't want to compete with that. Three, had some safety concerns around competing with that. But ultimately, whether, whether we liked it or not, that buyer segment or that buyer pool was ending up in someone else's funnel, right? Our, and, and the only way we were grabbing those people was we were paying for them, right? We, we had increased budgets on our leads. We, we were paying for the buyer. We, we had to pay for those buyers back. Now, interestingly enough, what I've seen change is all of a sudden top of the funnel is coming back to real estate agents because you can't push a button and just be shown something. And all of a sudden agents, and, and I was on a, a call this morning with some top agents and I shared that I think this is going to help us in two ways. Number one, it helps us with buyers because buyers recognize that one, they don't want to go look at 21 places either. 
right? They don't have time for that. And they are able to curate a, a, a small list of properties after digitally walking through or identifying, right? What are their top three out of 10? That's going to be a win for all of us on effectiveness and efficiency. But on the flip side of that, there were multiple companies out there telling sellers that they didn't need you, that they didn't need us as agents, that right, you can put it online and, and people could show it themselves and, and there was no agent involvement. Well, if we play our cards right, right, we have been dealt some cards and now it's our opportunity to play those right. The conversations with sellers is taking back the industry right now. Mm. Every seller needs you more than they ever did. I don't believe we should ever allow sellers to go back to the market that we're headed down with unaccompanied showings, like from a safety concern. We're going to live differently. Yeah. We all want to believe that like, okay, well, this will go away and, and then we'll just go back to, to life as normal. We won't. No. And I think if we do this the right way, it's not only a, an efficiency conversation with buyers, but it's a safety conversation with sellers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's doing work up front for those sellers to prevent them inconvenience later. Like we, we all of a sudden get to, to deliver the message and the conversation as opposed to third party companies or websites or tech companies only coming in and taking our, our buyers and sellers. Right, because those tech companies, those third parties have been nowhere this last eight weeks. They, they can't really do what we do at times like this, that's for sure. I, and, and I, you know, that there's some brilliant people leading those companies and there's some incredible money behind those companies. So they will figure out how to make money. It's just going to have to look different. And I think some of the, some of those companies that were, were moving away from the interaction with an actual physical agent mm -hmm. will recognize that they have to bring in those agents in a stronger or more consultative way than they did in the past. Good point. Good point. You mentioned, obviously, um, Buyers will look at less homes because they'll see more digitally. Is there a certain service or, or, or type of camera in order to really take our videos to the next level and make our, our online experience viewing homes? What's some of the things that your team might be doing or that you've seen that are you know, a step above or the cutting edge? A couple things. I, you know, I, I think um, we found ourselves unknowingly in an advantage because see in an expansion organization, I have to run an organization from a distance, no matter what, right? I live in Portland and have businesses running across the country. So I am not present on the ground in that city face to face with, with my customers, if you will, with my clients, if you will. So the, the fact is, is all of our business is done through Zoom. All of our business is, is done from afar. Gary, Gary said maybe seven years ago, six years ago, when he really started teaching and, and coaching expansion with a small group of us, he said, the greatest skill that you will, you will need to develop right now is leadership from afar. Well, leadership works when building business, leadership works of our customers and our clients. We are leading from afar and not face to face or in the same room. So we've, we've done consultations, we've done right meetings, we've done all of that digitally through Zoom for a long time on the ground, right? I, I'll just use my, my Portland team as an example. About five years ago, we had purchased a Matterport camera. So we owned that camera for the last five years and every single listing that we took, we did a 3D imaging. It didn't matter if it was a $4 million, $5 million home or a $140,000 condo, we did that 3D imaging. So for us, it was easy to just slide right into digital showings. In fact, the question we asked ourselves once we started was, why, why were we doing physical open houses when we get just as many visitors through the digital open and we've been able to convert them into, into listings sold? Like, I don't believe we're going to go back to how we used to do it. Mm -hmm. So that has been probably the, the most productive top of funnel. And keep in mind, the buyer pool has not shrunk. Right, pendings may be, may, may be down, and, and I'll show some data just in a minute. It's some data that I think all of us should be looking at every single week. But, but the number of pendings might be down, but the number of buyers has not dropped. Like they may have, they may be slower to act, but those buyers are still out there. There might so, be September buyers instead of, instead of June buyers. Yes, yep. Yeah. So, so in the past where we pulled those buyers, Gary says we pulled buyers from the future into today's market because yeah. of interest rates or inventory. Now we're going to be pulling right May and June and July buyers potentially yeah. into August, September, and October. If you look at nine 11, the, like that year and the year after 
the country sold almost as many homes as it did as it did prior to 9-11. Like the number of homes in our country does not, in terms of the number of home, homes sold, that doesn't change a whole lot no matter what goes on. It's just when will we sell them? And that's why we have to play the long game. That's why we have to be okay with delayed gratification. We may be stressing out one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, because gosh, I'm just not seeing the pendings that I thought I was going to see. But if we change our activity level, we will miss August, September, October. Right. So that, that's pretty critical. Let me share the screen real quick. Yeah, please, you should have the ability to do that. And while I pull the screen up, Mike Brody was on with us last week and he shared something that uh, the chief economist of the NAR shared that with all this, they expect to see nationally a 13% dip in sold this year, but we'll completely recover it in the next 12 to 18 months because we'll be up to 17, 18%. That was, that was their stat anyway. I love yeah. this. So these are, these are six market stats that I look at week over week over week for the markets that I'm in, right? In every market that I'm in. So I have these, like we have a team in Westchester County. So I have these for Westchester. These are Portland's. And, and this is how I look at this right now. I truly believe um, that data drives decisions, right? Like data will allow people to make decisions, but actually it sets reality for ourselves as well. So if you look a week after, right? Um, Portland showed up and, and they said, Hey, you need to shelter in place. I mean, the West coast, it showed up here first and then and then New York just blew yeah, up, right? But, but it showed up in Seattle and in Portland first. So week one, we had 798 listings. Week two, 716 listings. Week three, 650 listed. Like by week four, we're down to 485 listings. I mean, almost a 50% drop in listings, right? Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Well, but look at pendings, right? Pendings dropped. But look at week four, yeah. like we had 576 listings and 580 pendings. Look at week five, 485 listings, 593 pendings. So two things come up. Yeah. One, I wanna get very real. And I told my team, guys, as much as I love you and as much as I wish we could take 485 listings a week, we can't. So there's, there, there's, there's no reason our business should be down when the city took 485 listings. Like we can't service all of them. So we're going to be okay. We can't, we can't run 593 pendings. So there's always enough business for those that show up for it. Yep. But I also, as I see, we I see where you're going with the next one, because supply and demand is what affects price the most, right? Yeah. So then you, so, so a couple things, right. You'll also notice trends in sort of, um, I will always look at consumer confidence as one of the biggest drivers of real estate. Like, in fact, a lot of people look at interest rates and, and GDP and, and all of these metrics. I look at consumer, the consumer confidence index because the consumer confidence in, index drives whether I'm willing to part with my money. Like, am I willing to take money I have over here and buy anything, including a house? Um, and so I look for motivation shifts or changes because that's what a shift in the market is. Change in motivation of buyer, change in motivation of a seller, right? But when you look at those price changes, what happened? Week one, week two, week three, you see these sellers getting real nervous. Like, what's going on? What's going on? I better drop my price. I better drop my price. But then look at week four and week five. Mm -hmm. People have chilled. People have said, okay, I, I get what's going on here. Same thing with back on markets. Look, all of a sudden people started getting out of deals. Week one, 126 people got out of a deal. Week two, 140 people. Week three, 174 people. But look at week five. We're back to the week of. We're back to when nothing was wrong. 120 deals fell apart last week. I'm okay with that. So it's a spike in nervousness or fear that, that caused reaction. But when we're able to sit down with a seller or a buyer and say, hey, this is, this is the reality of the market. Like we're going back to where we were. It's good for us reframing our mindset, but also for our buyers and sellers. And what I'm seeing in your market is the same thing I'm seeing in my market. The, the dip in listings taken is greater than the dip in under contract. So from a supply and demand standpoint, our market, our supplies dropped by 75%, but our demand is only dropped by 45% which means there's still more buyers in the marketplace than sellers, which will put us in a very good price position over the coming months when we rebound out of this. One of the things I, I, I have built, I've built a, my career around is this idea that, um, that I'm not a salesperson, but I'm a consultant mm -hmm. and consultants get paid for clearly their opinion, which is an interesting thing, right? Because, 
because people are paying me for my opinion on the market. Well, then I better have one and I have, I better have a really strong opinion. So some people don't like opinionated people. Well, you guys are New Yorkers. New Yorkers We're used to it. And that's why you're a New no. Yorker at heart. That's what, that's what makes you opinionated. <laughs> yeah. So with that said, I, here's what I always tell myself. I'm going to look at my income over the last 12 months. And I promise you that that is what your opinion is worth. Mm. So if you want your income to increase, you, you better increase the value of your opinion. I don't think we're any different than a financial advisor or a doctor. People go to a doctor and they go for what? Like literally we walk in and said, Hey doctor, I want to get your opinion on my, my knee. And if we don't like that opinion or we're concerned about it, what do we do? We get a second, second opinion, opinion or a third opinion. It's the same in real estate. The doctors that, that perform at the highest level and have the best opinions, guess what? They also get paid the most. The same thing with real estate agents. And how do we develop an opinion? It can't be based on just, well, this is what I think. It has to be based on data. So those that know the market the best will have the best opinion and they will be the, 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 the most well-paid real estate agents. Our our, our, the value of our opinion is 100% dictated by our last 12 months of income. If you want to change it, change the value of your opinion. So let me ask you this, because that's the biggest question out there. When we're talking to sellers, we're talking to buyers. That's the biggest question they have. What do you see happening in the market over the next few months? You know, what, what's your short-term view on what this COVID-19, you know, eight, eight weeks in quarantine is going to do to the real estate market coming out of this? Yeah, my my I, I have a short term and long term. Yeah, my short term. Yeah. I'm going long term next. So <laughs> yeah, okay. My my short term opinion is is all product is dictated by supply and demand. All product, right? It doesn't matter the price point. It's supply and demand. And so I have to understand where the supply is in in every market that I'm in. Now, one of the and I'm gonna I'm gonna grab something really quick as well. Um, one of the things that um, I've been sharing with my clients. Um, and you'll see how quick, right? I'm on consultations all day. We should be on consultations with buyers and sellers all day. And I should within, I don't know, 10 seconds, just like that, be able to share data that you ask a question around. So here's Freddie mm -hmm. Mac's report, their economic and housing research insight report on housing deficits state by state by state. This is the housing deficit based on right migration patterns in and out of states. Like the fact is, is right. I'm in Oregon, so I have an 8.8 percent housing deficit, right? From 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 the running average of available housing, right? Like for me, when I look at that, and even New York, look, the state is actually it actually has a housing deficit. Now, there's parts of the country that do not. So if you're a buyer or a seller, and you're, you're asking me my opinion, uh, my opinion is going to be different in Nebraska than it is in Oregon. It's actually going to be slightly different in Florida than it is even in New York. But see, I have to look at data. So my short term is this. We, we have a housing deficit, and that's because we have not made up for the shortage of inventory that showed up in 07, 08, 09, 010. We haven't built enough units. We don't have enough units in most of our markets. Now, that's macro approach. On a micro level, you might look around your marketplace and say, actually, we, we actually have an oversupply of vacant homes, or we have an oversupply of homes. Well, then my message specifically is, especially right now, then with the interest rates the way they are at, it might be a phenomenal time to invest in real estate. Mm. So it's very specific. What I don't love, Michael, is when people post socially, it's a phenomenal time to sell. And then three days later, it's a phenomenal time to buy. Because ultimately, that's a sales pitch. Yeah, they're selling from emotion. My message has to be specific to what's going on in the macro and micro market. Yep. But but my my short term is we we just don't have enough housing units for the household formation that showed up and happened. Right. And just to, the salespeople tend to rely on emotions, whereas consultants rely on facts and logic. And that's that's the difference between those two. Um, Emily, can you know, can you mute that? There you go. Um, so so one one of the things that uh, um, we're seeing everywhere is I remember Jay Papazan saying it. We came into this with a supply issue. You know, nationally, we, we had a supply issue, um, you know, over the last couple of years because there's been a lack of new construction. So we're just kind of catching up to that now and we're seeing it with that graph. Could you share with us where you found that graph? Is that just from Freddie Mac website? Is that a public? Uh, yeah, it is. It's public. So okay. you can actually, we'll even, even if you just Google Freddie Mac um, housing deficit article, okay. you'll grab it.
Awesome. So, so short term, that, that's a great tool. And when you see the long term, I mean, we know a shift has been coming. Gary's been talking about it for a while. So what, 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 what are you looking at over the next couple of years? Do you have something that far out? Yeah, I mean, I, I, from, from my perspective, um, the, the one thing that I go back to is that we've never in the history of the United States seen so much equity. And so the equity in our housing will, will take us through the next couple of years. So a lot of people will take a step back and say, oh gosh, we're, we're headed for a recession, depression. But what's interesting in the last five recessions, on, only one have we seen real estate values go backwards. And that's the last one. Now our challenge in this industry is everyone remembers what happened last time, yeah. not the time before that and the time before that and the time before that. Yeah. But even, even in the depression, housing, right? The value of homes went up, right? The market could be doing one thing, GDP could be doing another. But interestingly enough, outside of the last housing recession, like we caused that, let's be honest. Like yeah. the housing market caused the last recession. It's the only recession where we saw housing values go backwards. So in my conversation, when someone says, gosh, I, I think I'm going to sit this out because I think values are going to drop about 15, 20%. Like I heard this yesterday. I said, well, show me the historical data. And like, well, it happened last time. And so then I'll just go through well, why did that happen last time? Housing caused it. What happened was we had negative equity across the country. I think we averaged about 2% equity going into the last housing recession. Right now, national home equity, this blew me away, is almost 50%. That is crazy. We have never seen so much equity. And to me, that gives me ridiculous confidence in what we do because our industry, our job for a living created the most wealth that we've seen in a very long time. Mm -hmm. So that actually leads me to a conversation is like, well, what should I be doing right now? Like tactically, Chris, what can we do? I think the first month of this, we all sort of, um, well, we, we immediately said, well, how do I take care of me and my family? And then we said, gosh, I better, I better make some care calls. Like that was like the, the go-to, make your care calls, make your care calls. And I woke up about a month ago, four weeks ago, and I just said, guys, I honestly believe that people have had enough care calls. We, we, have, we have to get into activity. And so we started making equity calls. Okay. It's a really simple strategy. I, I called every, I, we, we called a meeting and I said, I want every single agent in our organization to go back to all the buyers that they've, they've worked with, right? Maybe you've worked with three, maybe you've worked with 3,000, it doesn't matter get that list of every single buyer. And I'm going to look at the year that they bought and the market that they're in. And I'm going to look at what the average appreciation is over that time. Now the good news is and that's what these calls are. They're good news calls. The good news is we're coming out of one of the greatest and, and, and safest and most consistent value increases in real estate. That's why everyone has equity. So maybe it was three years ago that I sold this person a home in Portland. Well, over the last three years, we've seen a 15% increase in value. So all I'm doing, I'm not getting too deep into the data. I'm calling up and I'm calling that buyer and said, hey, um, I, I know I checked in and made sure you were okay a few weeks ago because we should have, right? Um, and if you haven't, do that. But I said, you know what? We are hearing a lot of bad news. And today I just decided to, to make good news calls. And I wanted to call with some equity calls. I want to let you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that you bought a house because in the last three years, you have about what looks to be about 15% equity in your home. And for some, I might say, if they bought it for 400, I might say, you have about $45,000 of equity in your home. Now, the next question is, what do you plan to do with that equity? Now, all of a sudden, it goes from a care call, like, a, and all you're going to hear is, well, we're doing okay, we're, 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 we're toughing it out, we're doing the best we can. Like, there, there's some benefit to that, yeah. but I think we've heard that enough. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, we can have a consultative conversation. Now, you have them thinking, wow, I've got money. Wow, I've got some wealth. What's next? And here's the deal. Like, one of three things is going to happen. This is our experience in the last month. One of three things is going to happen. They say, well, nothing. I'm glad I have that equity, but I'm really glad you call. Like, now we're, we're in their mind as real estate and a wealth advisor, reminding them what wealth you have helped them build, right? I'm, and, I, and I say that. I am so glad you let me work with you to help you buy a home. I truly believe that homeownership is the number one way to build, right, generational wealth. Two, 
Um, well, I don't know. Like, I haven't thought about anything. Don't, don't let them buy anything with that equity, by the way, other than a house. But I say, well, you know what? I, I believe that over the next 12 months, it might be a really great time to invest. So we might look at that equity. And if I find, if I, if I see something come up, that's a great investment. Would you, would you be willing to the conversation of using the equity to buy other real estate? Great. The other, the third thing that's happened here in Portland, listen, we have Nike and Columbia and Intel, and, and they've all done some major layoffs. We, we made two equity calls and, and, and almost word for word on both of them. Well, gosh, I, I'm kind of glad you called because both of us worked for Columbia and both of us lost our job and we probably need to sell. Yeah. You and you know what? Out and live off that equity. It is not a bad thing. So, so then you still are the hero. You still help them buy and, and build wealth that they actually absolutely need right now. Now, I don't, if they don't have to sell, I want them to stay in that house. But guys, we listed two houses in the month of, of April off of those equity calls. One of them we pended on a virtual open house to a buyer that we represented. Like this isn't like theory, it's tactical strategy. And at the end of the day, even if no one needs to sell and no one wants to buy, we've changed the, hey, I'm your friend to, hey, I'm your consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, change that, change that base. So I mean, I love that. So I was going to ask what some of your people are doing now. So that kind of answered that question already because we did exhaust the care call and now there's going to be a lot of opportunities out there if we structure that the right way. What are some of the things you're doing? This has come up in last calls to either keep your, your agents and your team motivated or yourself motivated. What are you kind of doing for the, the mindset and, and the energy of your people? Can I share something with you? Sure, Of course. How much um, time do you have? I want to make sure I'm respecting your time. How much time do you have for us today? Oh, I'm, I, I, to my, someone put it in my calendar until 11, so, which is 30 minutes from now. So okay. I'm good. I, you tell me where to stop. You can have me until then if you want. Cool, right. cool. I'm loving this. So we'll, we'll keep it going. Okay, so here's, here's probably one of the most important messages we've been sharing with our team. Right now, right now our biggest challenge is that um, we, we are all things to everybody, right? Like we are we are, uh, you know, we're, we're making calls in the morning. We're cooking dinner and lunch. Like we, we, we have kids that are doing math and science and Spanish lessons. We have like, we, we're going from zoom to email, to call, to doing laundry to, Hey, I just burned the dinner. Right. And, and the fact is, is that is incredibly overwhelming and we could wake up and go to bed and have put 15 hours of work in at the end of the day, I take a step back and I said, did I even move the needle? <laughs> did, I, did I accomplish anything? And in the first week and a half of this, that was me. Like literally I was working more hours and I work hours, right? But I was working more hours than I've ever worked. And I truly didn't feel like I was moving the needle. So I began to ask myself three questions every single day. Question number one, what can I do? Right? Mm -hmm. What can I do today? What, what could, or what can I do today? Question number two, and that is, that's just clarity. That gives me some clarity around this day. Like, what am I allowed or what can I do? Mm -hmm. Question number two is, okay, I got my list of what I could do. What will I do? Now that is, that is for me confirming, right? Like I've gone through what I could do. This is what I will do. And those are two very different questions. My third question comes at the end of the day. What did I do? Now, what I have found over the last probably 45 days of doing this, and I literally put this in my journal, what can I do? What will I do? What did I do? Some days I don't do what I said I was going to do. And guess what? That when I do, we go from clarity to confirmation to confidence. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the more days I could go, right, saying I will do this and knocking it out, it gives me confidence that I'm in control of my day and my week and my month and my quarter and my year. Here's the challenge. Um, the, the number one skill that we can have right now is, is delayed gratification. Okay. Delayed gratification. And here's why. Couple, couple things show up. Charles Duhigg uh, is, a, is, a, is a behavioral psychologist and an incredible writer. One of the, one of the psychologists that I read a lot and, and um, understand the brain with. And he says this, the basis of every bad habit is instant gratification. The basis of every single bad habit is instant gratification. Just think about it, right? Sleeping in, 
right? If you hit snooze 14 times this morning, it's instant gratification, yeah. right? It's a bad habit, by the way, but it's just instantly gratifying to stay on the pillow or stay in bed right? Eating bad, let's be honest, like we all do it. And the reason why is because the pizza or the cookies or, 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 or the alcohol tastes good going down, right? It's instant gratification, right? Social media, TV, all of it, every bad habit is just we want to be instantly gratified. Now, the basis of all good habits, Charles Duhigg says, is learned delayed gratification. We don't wake up, we're not born with delayed gratification. It's learned gratification. Eating healthy, there's nothing immediately gratifying about that. Like we don't instantly look better. Like we don't instantly feel better. We don't instantly like putting the time into or the money into eating healthy. Like working out, it's not instantly gratifying, right? It doesn't change our waistline day one, right? We don't even, it doesn't even feel good working out. It hurts, <laughs> right? Like all good habits are learned delayed gratification. So I've been sharing this test with, with everybody. And it's a test that everybody knows because we've seen the videos and it was the marshmallow test. Another behavioral psychologist, Walter Michelle, back in Stanford University uh, in the 1970s, um, ran this test. And it's one of, the, one of the most important tests for our businesses, guys. Uh, so he, he put together this test and he invited four and five-year-olds into what he called the game room at Bing Nursery at Stanford. And in that room were these trays, right? Some had marsh, it's called the marshmallow test, but the real test, they had M&Ms and Oreo cookies and chocolate chips and what, like all types of candy. And they asked the kid, hey, what's your favorite? And they picked one. They said, great, I'm going to leave the room. At any time in the next 15 minutes, you can eat that marshmallow if you wish. But if you don't for the next 15 minutes, when I come back, I'll give you two and then you'll get two. And then he left the room and they videoed these children. like on your off time, right? Not during your work day. That's a great video if you watch it. I mean, this, this oh, video is hilarious, she'll laugh. <laughs> it is awesome, it is, it is so awesome, right? If you need to smile, watch these videos. So here's, here's the lesson. Um, some kids, the minute they left, man, they were marshmallow in their hand and in their mouth immediately. Uh, other kids, right, they, they, like, they fought it. They looked away, they looked at the marshmallow, they looked away, and, and five minutes in they grabbed it and ate it. And other kids waited 15 minutes, he came back in and they got two. And, and there's two things, like the kids that were able to wait, were able to remove their focus from instantly gratifying their stomach by eating the marshmallow. And they would, you, you watch these videos with them looking at their fingers, closing their eyes and singing a song. Some of them would count numbers. So it's, it's an incredible study around focus, right? It's a study around focus. But here's the real win, guys. They tracked these children years later and researchers conducted follow-up studies. And here's what they found. The children that were willing to delay gratification and wait to receive that second marshmallow, the children that were willing to do that later on had better SAT scores. They had lower levels of substance abuse. That They had lower levels of childhood of obesity. They had um, better responses to stress. They had better social skills as reported by their parents and teachers. The fact is, is this experiment showed that the ability to delay gratification was critical for success in life. Welcome to real estate. There, <laughs> there's no better study for us to realize that the most phenomenal real estate agents have been able to delay gratification. Now, I, I, I tell this a, a, a lot to a lot of real estate agents, but probably the greatest thing my parents did for me, they didn't know it and I didn't know it at the time, but I grew up with the word no. It was always no. Can I have this? No. Can we go there? No. Can we do this? No. It was always no. We didn't have any money to do anything, go anywhere, or buy anything. But what I didn't realize that was teaching me was delayed gratification. The problem for some of us is we grew up in a different generation. See, we came from that generation. What we want to do is, oh, well, I don't want my kids to go through that. So I'm going to give them what they want. I'm not, mm. And the problem is, if we're not careful, we'll create a generation with zero delayed gratification. You want to buy something, you put it in Amazon, you get in, in, in an hour. Yeah. But see, this is learned delayed gratification. Yeah. 
And the beauty of the, the crisis that we're in right now is some of us are learning delayed gratification for the first time. Some of us won't be able to handle it and will leave the industry. But those of us that are willing to stick with the activities and delay gratification are going to win. In a similar experiment in LA, they pulled eighth graders, right? Eighth graders. And they said, listen, we're going to give you five bucks or come back in a week and we'll give you 10. Well, the majority of kids took five bucks now, but here's what they realized. The kids that came back for 10, that simple gauge of self-control turned out to correlate with their grade point average better than their IQ. See, for me, that's a win. I don't have to be the smartest. I don't have to be the most engaging. I don't have to, I don't, I don't have to come with any inborn qualities. I just have to be able to learn delayed gratification. It will, it will beat IQ every single time. I, I love that. Just the simple fact of the world's now making us more immediate gratification people than delayed. I mean, even as a kid, I'd at least have to wait till the weekend to go to the store to get that particular thing. Whereas now it's, hey, give me your phone, dad. Can we just order it on Amazon? So it, it, I lo love those concepts. And as much as I've seen the marshmallow video and I posted the link to the marshmallow video in the chat, um, I never found out the studies afterwards. So I, I love how, you know, those SAT scores and some of the later things in life. What's really interesting is, I, you know, my, my wife and I were, were raised completely differently. She, uh, my wife is from Mexico, but she was raised um, in anything that they really wanted, they got. I'm not judging that, but that's how she was raised. I was raised different. So with our kids, right, imagine that clash of culture. <laughs> so, so I tell you, mom a lot more often than dad, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but, but that doesn't work. But, but I will say no a lot, right? And, and my wife will ask me, like, they're colored pencils. Why don't you just get them? And I said, because, because if you say yes to everything, they won't learn gratification. So if they really want something, listen, I want them to have it too. I will put it in the Amazon car. I will let them, but they're not buying it. I'll come back to it tomorrow. Do you still want these? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about it tomorrow. I'll come back to it tomorrow. If, if in three weeks they still want them, I'm okay with spending $3.45 on the colored pencils. But the exercise, which my wife says it's torture, like I'm, I'm unnecessarily torturing them, it's not. It is learned, delayed gratification. But see, we need to do that for ourselves as well. It is one of the greatest mindset and actual tactical strategies that we need in our real estate business because we all love exponential growth in our business. And guess what? Maybe you will see that this year and maybe you won't. Don't give up if you don't. We're going to do things that seem very, very linear right now. Like I made my calls, I made my calls, I made my calls, I made my calls, I made my calls. And delayed gratification will say, if you still do it, you will see a result later. Nice. Um, Winston Churchill, one of my, my, one of my favorite leaders, uh, in, in Stephen Mansfield's book on, on leading under crisis, Winston Churchill um, believed they, they say Winston Churchill had a bias towards action. And sometimes it was symbolic action. So um, I shared this in a couple, uh, a couple meetings this week. Um, when, when, when the Nazi bombers came to bomb London, right? Everybody was told to go down to the bunker, right? Like there, there's a bomber in the air, like they're dropping bombs. You go to the bunker for, to, for your life. Winston Churchill wouldn't he would go straight to his roof and he would take out a revolver and shoot at the bomber. Now, a revolver, newsflash, a revolver is not going to take down a, 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 bomber. a bomber, right? Yeah, probably not. But, but this is what Winston Churchill said. He said, at times in our life, we need to take symbolic action, mm. right? Shooting the gun was not going to win the war. However, that symbolic action established himself to himself as a leader and everybody around him saw him doing the activities that it took to win a war over time. Guys, right now, it might feel like symbolic action. I have heard people say, you know what, Chris, I don't want to do a virtual open house. Those don't work. You know what? Do it. Symbolically do the activity. Yeah. And the fact is, is you'll learn along the way that that symbolic action will turn into results. So we just have to have a bias towards action every single day. Yeah, I love that. Well, other people are running for cover. He's going to challenge the opposition. So again, what you say to yourself, I look at that old study of what 
what, what they do when they study water under a microscope and they use different words. You yeah. know, the, the things we tell ourselves mean a lot to us internally. So that symbolic action is key. I noticed you had 36 slides there and the couple you shared have been amazing. Is there anything in there that you have a burning desire to share that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I'll share one more thing. I can keep uh, asking questions, again, but I, I'm realizing you've got a lot of good stuff hidden in that PowerPoint over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm just bringing you into some of the stuff we've shared with our team. I'm going to share um, one book with you. Uh, Jim Quick is a, a brain coach. Um, he has worked with some of the, actually, and I hope I get an invite to that Mariana Rivera interview. He was like a, a hero growing up in New York. Hey, um, hey, Emily, you, make sure we get him an invite to that. You, you, you'll have it. There'll be a room you can go in. It's, it's for Red Day, by the way. So there'll be a room you can go, go in to make a donation that will oh, get you into it. a Mariano room exclusively. We'll even send you an autographed baseball from that room. So we're doing all these things as part of this as a Red Day fundraiser. Super awesome. So Jim Quick, brain coach, right? He's worked with Alex Rodriguez. He's worked with Maria Shriver, Stan Lee, one of his, his, his um, most well-known um, students, if you will, is Will Smith. And um, Jim Quick says that... Um, here, here's, here's just one little piece out of his book. He says, um, we are often like thermometers, right? Because thermometers react to the environment. As human beings, over the last couple months, I've seen a lot of real estate agents acting like thermometers, right? It's just naturally, right? The environment's hot. What happens? Like the thermometer just reacts. It goes up. The temperature goes down. What does the thermometer do? Well, that hand goes down. And he said, we need to stop being like a thermometer and start acting more like a thermostat. Mm. See, the thermostat doesn't react to the environment. It actually gauges the environment and then acts and puts things literally into motion to adjust the environment. And so I've had this image in my mind because at times, right, perhaps as, as, as late as this morning, like we, we tend to react. We tend to take a situation or an environment or something someone said or, or a deal's falling apart and we just become that thermometer. We're like stress goes up, so we react. As opposed to saying, listen, my thermostat is set to a, a chill 68. Like my thermostat is set. Now I'm going to gauge the environment and the environment is going up or it's going down. What do I need to do to bring the environment to me? Mm. And, I, and I, I love the way that he describes that because ultimately the, the thermostat sets the temperature. The thermostat allows us to recognize that we can set our goals. We can set our vision. We ultimately do make the environment more about um, what, what we create than what we're given. So it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter where we're at. It's just, okay, well, what's the temperature in the, in the marketplace? What's the temperature, um, what's, what's the temperature in, 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 in our city, in our state, in our country? Uh, just just be the thermostat awesome hey guys as you wrap up the last few minutes can you please throw your ahas into the chat box love to hear what you got out of this so far and uh, if you do have a question for chris now would be a great time to ask it um and chris I, I haven't done this and we didn't plan this this isn't the reason why you're on the call um but i'm sure you guys are always looking for uh people that might want opportunities with with your with your group if someone wanted to explore opportunities with, with your group who should they reach out to for that uh, they can reach out to me directly. I mean, we're, we're uh, um, uh, a, here, here's what I've learned. Uh, we actually just had, and I'll share this because I think it's relevant. We had a call um, with our leadership just yesterday. And I said, I have a question for you, right? You know, the, the, the basis of this world and success is, is based on powerful questions. And I said, I, wanna, I want you to look at people that are with our organization and those that may, may not be with our organization anymore right? And tell me what you think the key to retention is. Now, this is going to work with retention of buyers, retention of relationships, retention of people. Like, what is the key to retention? And Katie Benson, our director of expansion, one of the most brilliant business women I've ever gotten into business with. She's been in business with me for, for just over a decade. She actually introduced me to KW, so I owe her a lot of my She was a team leader at one point, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for me. Yeah, seven years. She was a team leader for me. Iconic. Um, and she said this. She said, Chris, those that worked hard to get into our world are still here, every single one of them. Mm. Those that we begged because we really wanted them in our world may not be here. Mm. 
Now, what's interesting is we've never let, we've never had a true partner, right? One of our, our teams ever leave us. Never, right? I've never had a team leave. Ben Kinney has never had a team leave. Like our partnership has never had someone leave. There's a reason for that. But as we looked at retention, it's because getting in, we have made very challenging, right? We're typically in relationship with people four, five, six months. So how, how, how do we do that? Um, it's it, it, it reach out and get into relationship, right? Reach out and it, it definitely takes some time. But what we believe is if we work hard for something, don't we hold on to it? Man, if we work hard to accomplish something, we hold on to that. And that is the basis of, of, of all retention. Some of us are building teams, right? I know a lot of people on the call. Yeah. Some of us are building brokerages. The fact is, if, if people work hard to be part of your world, they will stay in your world. And, and that's, a, that's a, it's a big deal to me. So that's how I would answer that question. Reach out to me personally. We'll develop a relationship. And, and months from now, maybe we'll be in business together. Take it over time. Chris, you've been awesome. I'm watching the ahas. I'm watching the, uh, the comments. Uh, you've been a huge, huge hit. Thank you so much. It's great to have a New Yorker even displaced on the West, West Coast spend some time with us. If I could ever return the favor, please let me know. I'm happy to support you any way I can. Awesome. I and appreciate it greatly. Thanks for what you do. You got it. Thank you, Chris. And guys, as always, we do have a quick funny video. So Chris, I always start the music with dancing and end the music with something funny. And this is a song. Um, which this is actually not a bad link that you can send out to your clients as a quick, funny touch regarding uh, quarantine. So you can dance, you can listen, you can have fun. It's about two minutes and 45 seconds. Then we'll tie up the call and enjoy the song. And